You know, my favorite um, single line comment about Lohengrin and its absolute specialness really comes on the title page of the work itself. Lohengrin is the one work that Wagner identified as eine romantische Oper. It's a romantic opera. Um, and the, the, the concept of Lohengrin as a romantic opera, I think, uh, defines and, and limits, in a way, everything that we can say about the work. Um, Thomas Mann was, as you all know, one of the great Wagnerian um, commentators. Um, and um, had a lot of very interesting and very important and also very timely things to say about uh, Wagner. And Wagner was, of course, this tremendous love of Thomas Mann's, and yet it was the specific event which got Thomas Mann really thrown out of Germany. He wasn't thrown out and chose not to return. Uh, was the, uh, a series of lectures that he was giving on, on Wagner on, um, in, in 1933, which happened, of course, also to be the year of Hitler's taking power, and which was published as The Sufferings of Greatness of Thomas uh, uh, Richard Wagner, and which uh, led to a huge protest which was signed by Fort Wagner and, and uh, Thomas Bush and a lot of other people in the, in the music and arts world in Germany, and got into a lot of trouble. Although it's, it's, if you read it, I mean, it's an enormously uh, uh, loving work. Mann never lost his love for Wagner. Uh, but Mann says that um, of all of Wagner's works, the one that has the most um, non-intellectual attraction to him is Lohengrin. And it, it is indeed Lohengrin's romantic essence, as a romantic work of art, which is so um, intoxicating to him. And presumably it was also to be living. And um, the and he says something I think which is really quite wonderful. He says that Lohengrin contains the single most romantic moment in the history of art, all art, the quintessential romantic moment in art. Anybody guess what it is? I'm going to play it. That'll play it. And, and and it's quintessential romantic moment in all art, not just for the music. It's for everything. What it represents, what it is, uh, how it comes about. No one has an answer. Simon, do you know? I'm sorry, I'll take it down a <laughs> What did you just say? Who did that? Do you know the answer? No, I, I didn't get the question. Okay, the question is, yes. Thomas Mann says that the low and moon contains one single specific moment which is the, the highest and most spe special moment and the most quintessential definition of the, the romantic in art. Specifically in German art, but he means in all art. The most romantic moment in art. Well, why are you putting me on? Okay. No, 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 no. I've read the answer yes, several times. <laughs> okay. No one wants to come up with an answer. Jim, what would you think it would be? We're all among friends here, you know. <laughs> is, is it the 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 the, uh, the, the grail? The definition of the grail? No, no. It's, it's more. It's, he has an answer to our dreams. What? Well, you know, that, that's 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 the really close to it. When he answers. But actually, even more romantic. What is more romantic? The answer to the dreams when he arrives, or the dream itself? And so his, his, what he defines as the romantic moment, the quintessential romantic moment in all art, is when Elsa, you know, she's up there and sort of, her, sort of we don't understand who's this woman, and she can't say much, and she's kind of muttering about her brother, and she won't, and then she goes into this ecstatic trance, and she says, and says, I'm not in the right place for this. We'll move this for uh, for Sunday. I should have my back to you. Guys. You know, she comes on stage and she's all very miserable. Those are be my glasses. Where are my glasses? And we hear her theme. This is, I'm asking the, the mistress of the air conditioner to, to make a switch for a while and turn it off because the, the wind really bothers my voice. I'm going to run out of voice today. Thank you very much.
Now, this is not the moment yet, but this is all absolutely essential for the moment. I can move down on the um, Essential for the moment because already we've established something. By this phrase, she's very sad. It seems sort of sad and lonely and unprotected. The music is, is giving life to this, this, this tableau. Uh, the fact that this is all music that we've already heard in a way and this, uh, is also uh, resonates. That I'm going to talk about on Sunday. The, uh, with this, that's the core of, of Elsa's music. Um, actually, it's also the core of, of, of um, Lohengrin's music. Very interestingly enough, Lohengrin and Elsa have the same music. We'll talk about that also later. Um, so anyway, the moment of her actual dream is she's been she's you know she can't get out of this this sort of dark trance and um, King begs her to speak, defend yourself, defend yourself, defend yourself, and she has. Grow directly out 
of the very power and the very concentration that Wagner puts on releasing this quintessentially romantic character. Um, one of the things that's most striking about Lohengrin to me is, is that Lohengrin, even in relationship to uh, the previous two dramas, they eliminate the, the apprenticeship works, but just the Flying Dutchman and Kahnweiser, contains almost none of two of Wagner's absolutely pr primary characteristics that, that kind of supersede almost, uh, I think, to, at least to my mind, even his mus musical language and everything else. One of them is Wagner is extremely interested in his music dramas in giving motivation to his characters, making us not only know, but feel, understand, become involved emotionally with the, what makes the characters tick. In a certain kind of way, uh, uh, the most sort of, the, I hate to use the word quintessential again, but quintessential Wagnerian scene or is a scene where people talk about what has happened or recounting, you know, what's gone on in the past, what has been the past. And then also the quintessential Wagnerian technique is what we call the likelihood technique, uh, which is not really apparent here in Lohengrin, although there's something in Lohengrin which we'll, we'll talk about. But in both cases, the purpose of these things is to give depth and foundation to what the characters are, are like. Not only what is happening, none of Wagner's works are primarily about what people do. It's the way people are, the way they feel, the situations in which they are in. It's not, whereas Verdi's operas are primarily about, I mean, prim primarily is too big a word, but very much about, as he himself says, the uh, dramatic exploitation of situations. He was really in that idea of the situation. Well, Wagner has his situations too. But what I think Wagner's works are primarily about most of the time is uh, the drama that grows out of people who are, are, are dramatic uh, characters, of who they are, how they have become, and why they are the way they are. And Wagner is, I think, extremely intent in most of his works on getting even his most um, stock characters a certain amount of, uh, of, of background, musical background. I mean, one of the things that Wagner is the greatest at is with his villains. You know, usually it, the villains are sort of stock characters that don't have very much to them. I mean, uh, even even in, in, in otherwise well fleshed out pieces, very often the villain is kind of a, 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 a one dimensional figure. Um, and in, in most of our, well, of course, in some of our works, it's a little bit hard to say who the villain is. But in, let's say in, 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 in uh, Beck Messer, for instance, or um, I don't know who the villain would be exactly in Flying Dutchman, maybe, maybe uh, Dollar, maybe the father, but certainly Alberich and Hagen and Klingsor. I mean, these are all extremely complex and characters that we're very much involved with, I mean, you know, which I think very often has led to some grave. Uh, uh, errors on the part of uh, 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 stage designers and, and, and uh, directors of Wagner works because because Wagner is so intent on getting his background for his, for his characters, even his villains, they sometimes have mistaken his villains for his heroes, which happens all the time in the ring where, where you know, Alvarez becomes more sympathetic than Wotan, who is more sympathetic than Siegfried, etc., etc., which, you know, and um, <clears throat> Which in a way is Wagner's own fault, because if, if, if Alberich and Hagen were just stick one-dimensional villains and Siegfried were just a stick one-dimensional hero, then it wouldn't arise. You wouldn't be able to do this kind of thing. Um, the, the, other, the other, I think, quintessential Wagnerian characteristic in his work as far as his characters go, is that his, which is sort of, it goes together with this first one about having background and motivation to his characters, is, is that um, there is a sort of a stock, I think I even gave a hand out here. I've given it out in my right anyway. About first part of my own. Have I given that out here? Yeah. 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 But th that might have just been by right. I, I think just in Byron. Just in Byron. Um, <clears throat> first part of note is, is a quote from uh, Parsifal. Anybody want to tell me who says it when? It's a great one. What it means is dreadful predicament. Dre dreadful predicament. Anybody remember where it comes from? Forced to file a note. It's sort of almost said as an aside. There's been a long silence, and then this, some character says, forced to file a note. Is it Germans? No, no, it's not Germans. No, it's, it's, it's Klingsor. It's Klingsor. Oh. And it's said after 
Kudry very impolitely has reminded him that he's castrated himself. Uh, <laughs> well, what she says is, are you chaste? But she says it with a very knowing, uh, uh, and the context is extremely shared. There's this awful moment he says, forced by a no. It's a dreadful predicament. And, and, but generally, I mean, his predicament is, is, is a very, is a very radical example. But generally, the Wagnerian predicament is that characters want something they can't have, and the reason they can't have it is not so much because of external factors, but internal factors, factors within themselves. I mean, the, I mean, Pleasor wants to be holy, wanted to be holy, in order to be holy, because he couldn't bank the, the fires of, of lust, castrates himself, and then, of course, has been banned from holiness forever. But not only that, he still longs, I mean, it's even worse, because he still longs, he still has, has he, he still longs for, with lustful thoughts, but now he can't even do anything about it. So it's particularly bad. But this kind of predicament we see in all of Wagner's works, and many, many characters, and not necessarily even always in major characters. Um, we see it in, in several characters in Tannhäuser. We see it at least in two or maybe three characters in Flying Dutchman. We see it throughout the ring. We see it in Tristan. We see it in Meistersinger. In other words, it's not even necessarily tragic. Meistersinger is a comedy, and yet Hans Ochs is a perfect example as could be made of it. But even Polter has some of this. But if we look in um, Lohengrin, there's really only one character who is a truly Wagnerian character in this respect. Um, and it's not, the, it's not one of the, well, it is one of the main characters, but it's not one of the really main characters. Uh, it's Tellerman, for your Tellerman. He is a very Wagnerian character in this respect because uh, he does have a predicament in this way, and that, well, in, in, in this way, in that he wants very much to be, I think, uh, almost like Gunther. He has a lot in common with Gunther. He wants to be respected. He wants to be honorable. He wants to be grand and glorious and, and all that. And um, he um, is locked up by his, he's under the spell of his, of his wife. I've always assumed that Orchard is his wife. Do we really know that she's his wife? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. But she's not a, she's not a Brabantian. She's from out of town. Oh yeah, she's clearly from out of town. Different house. He says he, 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 he abandoned his claim on Elsa yeah. Yeah. and uh, took um, yeah. and she's, off of his wife. And she's, she's really obviously bewitched him. Yeah. 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 Um, and, 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 and he, were, he to me is in many ways a rather typical Wagner character. But the other major characters in Lohengrin are not. Um, they're, they, they really stand apart from most Wagnerian uh, characters. Lohengrin himself. And, and this is an order that Lohan would be this ideal romantic figure. And I, I'm hoping that I'm, you're going to completely debunk everything I'm saying. Uh, this, this, this quintessential romantic figure, Lohengrin is, in a way, the most mysterious of Wagner's heroes. I mean, we can say, somebody can say, well, he already loved Elsa from afar. But that's just a, an, an idle fact that, first of all, he's not given to us in the libretto. It's outside the score. And second of all, it means nothing to us. He walks on stage and is completely mysterious and very, very evocative way and says, Ich liebe dich. You know, I love you. Right off the bat. I'll say Ich liebe dich to a, an unbelievably exposed IA. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean, which I unfortunately heard people crack on. <laughs> uh, we have no reason. I mean, we see Zygmunt and Linda fall in love. We have given all sorts of background as to what's behind their falling in love, both on the outside and on the inside. All sorts of dynamics. Um, now, Tristan and Isolde have already fallen in love before. But we get lots of background into that, and all their their uh, fair force of no, they're both really into that. They both have major problems with that. Uh, uh, and we get sort of, even though we don't actually see it, we hear a lot about it, we get a lot of musical background on it. But with Lohengrin, he just is. He is. And the part of, I think, this quintessentially romantic thing is the state of just being. He just is. Elsa, she is just the damsel in distress. We really don't really know anything about Elsa. It doesn't really matter. We don't know anything about Orchard. I mean, Orchard is just the black, cursed, evil witch of mythology. I'm not a mythology so much of children's tales. And our children's tales, the real romantic material, because they, they're so based on some in, intrinsic thing within us, this kind of dream world. And this dream world uh, doesn't really brook interpretation or analysis or 
Now, it may have behind it all sorts of Freudian levels, and I'm sure Lohengrin does. <clears throat> but in a way, the experience of Lohengrin as its characters and people has this extremely timeless, static quality. These characters don't do, they don't so much even feel, they just are. They are what they are. And they remain in this kind of, I mean, we don't see enormous amounts of change. Um, uh, Jim was saying that, that Elsa changes. I don't, I mean, the only thing that changes is that the, the doubt grows, I guess you could say. But in a way, she seems the same kind of person. Um, to my mind, even though I know that it has lots of, uh, th there is a lot behind it, in a way, of course, the situation is completely, entirely plausible. I mean, what woman in the world, it's bad enough the husband says, you know, I can't tell you who I am. But he comes and makes this big, dramatic statement, I will love you and save you if you promise never to ask me who I am or I come from my race is. I mean, under those circumstances, is there anyone in the world who wouldn't immediately start wondering? <laughs> in a way, in a way, aren't aren't Hortrude's blandishments and 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 Thelma's threats completely idle? They're actually meaningless. I mean, wouldn't she be that way anyway in any kind of real world? But of course, Lohengrin is not about any kind of real world. Of all of Wagner's operas, it's the only one I feel which, at least on this level, is not at all about the real world. It is about the real world, but in quite a different way. Not in the way of the workings of the characters interacting as people in other ways. And, excuse me? I think it's, it's the mystery of the grave. Okay, let's talk about that in a second. The mystery of the, I think that's that's probably something that, that, that Simon will talk about. But the mystery of the grail, the mystery of the grail is actually also, he's yes, he's from, but it's irrelevant to the the, the story. It actually exists on the outside. The story is that we have a damsel in distress, we have an evil witch who has set up a situation, who's got a guy in, in tow helping her do it, and the, the, the damsel in distress goes on her knees and prays, and the knight in white armor, without explanation, comes and saves her. And it puts a condition on her thing which she cannot uh, live up to, and so he goes back where he came from. And now, what the grail means and all that, that's another story, and that's very important indeed. But in terms of the actual basic story, that's it. That's, that's the basic story. Uh, uh, try, try doing the ring story in, in, uh, in somewhere. Try, try, try describing even one scene, one part of the ring. Just try to describe the, the uh, parental relationships in the ring. Just who's related to whom and how much <laughs> in, 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 one, in one sentence. But that, 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 by the way, is not, none of this is in itself intrinsically a criticism of Lohengrin. It's just uh, 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 looking at Lohengrin as this extremely uh, romantic work, as this work of sort of a, 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 a dream work. And indeed, I think that the, the, the way we feel, the prelude of Lohengrin especially, which after all is our introduction, the prelude of Lohengrin works, I thought that Jim actually said that really well. It's not like a prelude in the sense of the preludes uh, in the ring or in the other earlier Wagner works, if we, if, there's one other big exception. Generally, uh, either set the stage for what we're going to see. Sometimes they make a comment on what we've last. Sometimes preludes to the second act will comment on what's happened at the, the, the first act, sort of act as a bridge. But usually they set the stage for what's going to come in, uh, um, ahead. Or in some cases, like in Meister's Singer, they sort of, and, and as in Gilbert and Sullivan, or as in Roger and Hammerstein, they sort of tell the story. They get sort of a capsule version of the whole story. You know, the, you get all the tunes, or many of the tunes, and, and you know, it's sort of a, a, a general picture. Parsifal Prelude is a little different, but it has some of that too. Parsifal Prelude is supposed to be like the Lohengrin Prelude, I think it is. Um, but the Lohengrin Prelude is like a portal. Uh, it's like uh, in the Harry Potter, you know, they grab that thing and they get taken someplace else. It, it grabs us and uh, brings us from the real world, the outer world, into this magic fairy tale world. It, it is the sort of the, 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 tra the, the transport that we enter. And it, it, it's extraordinarily risky work. And it's very important it's the, it's to note also, it is the only Wagnerian prelude which was written after the rest of the work was completed. I mean, the prelude of Meistersinger supposedly to some extent was, but that's just bunk because they already played uh, a version of it. I mean, it's, it's, it was not written after. It really only Lohengrin was written after the whole rest of the work. 
And I think that, that there, that again, because not only does it, it's not so much that it sums up the work, it only deals really with, with, with one aspect of the vision of the grail, as you just said. But, but it does, what the grail does do function in this sense is, is that it focuses into us this entrance into this magical realm, which is, which is lonely. Now, um, now let's talk about music, or at least all of this in terms of music a little bit. And then I'm going to spend Sunday going into the details about this. There are certain musical aspects to Lohengrin which very, very clearly reflect this very special, static, romantic quality to it. Uh, of it. Um, one of the most extraordinary aspects of Lohengrin is it kind of almost sounds like idle statistics, except to a, a musician, it, it's, it's truly unbelievable. And it's unbelievable for Wagner especially, because Wagner, even in his earliest works, even in Rienzi, uh, is careful to obey certain kinds of rules <coughs> is too strong a word, but certain kind of principles of compositional, uh, uh, of the composition of sustained works. And one of the rules of composition of sustained works is you avoid having everything in the same tempo or the same sound or the same meter, you know what I mean by meter, you know, time signature, over too long a period of time because it becomes tired. So you, 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 you contrast. I mean, this would be true certainly in number operas. Like if, if you look at an opera by um, Mozart or Gluck or Bellini or Donizetti or Meyerbeer, or, you know, they'll have fast pieces and slow pieces contrasting. They'll have, a, you won't have nine duets in a row. You have, you know, things, all this kind of thing. You, you make careful there's a certain amount of contrast. Lohengrin has one absolutely flabbergasting aspect to it. The entire score the entire piece, with the exception of one short passage in the first act, which somebody can tell me what it is, uh, is entirely in four. It's in square four four time. Now this is either an act of unbelievable audacity on the part of Wagner, or the biggest single wonder in the history of music, to write a four hour opera entirely in four four time. Because four four is the square, you know, one, two, three, it's either like a march or a procession. Now, when Jim was talking about the fact that the harmonics movement always happened at the same time in this regular thing, this is very, very much uh, uh, emphasized by the fact that it's all in 4-4. The entire second and third act of Lohengrin entirely are in 4-4, or in, in some variant that, that comes down to being 4-4. It doesn't have to be written 4-4 to be in 4-4 in musical terms. Although almost all of it really is written in 4-4. Anybody know what the one part of Lohengrin that is in 3-4 is, actually works, it's, it's unbelievably um, um, refreshing, actually. I mean, I think we're all, you don't have to be a musician, by the way, you, you, you hear this, you feel this. These are things that are very much uh, that you feel. One place is in three. King's Prayer. The King's Prayer, who said that? Very good. How did you know that? I listened to a CD. <laughs> <laughs> and you just happened to notice that the King's Prayer was in three? They pointed this out. <laughs> Um, what's the, so, you know, right before the, the, the duel, and actually, one of the, that would be something that I wish I didn't, I can't really play that off the piano very effectively. One of the absolutely uh, stupendous dramatic moments in the Lundgren, maybe, maybe Simon has this moment you do, is at the end of the King's Prayer, when we hear uh, the, the trumpet fanfare, uh, um, you know, the one, the, <laughs> the one we hear 195,000 times. Wagner's music, certainly. 
However, the point of fight scenes is that our attention is not on the score, but on the action. Uh, maybe Wagner's dramatic genius is such that he knows that, you know, one of the reasons why Hamlet has never made a good opera is perhaps that the, the, the libretto is too good. And if you can't pay attention to the music when the poetry is so great. Well, if, if he wants our attention to be really on what people are doing on stage, and you know, there is a fight, another fight that you could have mentioned too, but it's so fast. It's the fight at the end of the second act of Tristan. Did you put that in the same category as well? Yeah. No, it's not that. No. No, I agree. <laughs> if it had been Lohengrin, if it had been written, yeah, if it right. was Lohengrin, yeah. it'd be 10 minutes. Yeah, that's right. It'd be 10 minutes. And besides, in fact, that went all the way, it's all on offbeats too. Tristan is the only person who gets killed on an offbeat. Not killed. <laughs> Part of hearing 
But um, the, the, if you open the lower grip, the first violin is sort of divided into eight parts, um, and to create a very special sound. It's supposed to go from the very transparent sound of the violins being divided into a lot of parts into a more uh, sort of more, more, more masked sound. So anyway, the violin is divided into eight parts, which is a very revolutionary idea, really, although he's not quite the first person to do that, but practically. And there was a problem. The list had five first violinists in his orchestra. So I always wonder what in the world it must have sounded like. And, uh, uh, you know, in other words, it, it would be sort of like trying to drive in, in a Cadillac from uh, um, New York to San Francisco, but you only have three wheels. Uh, <laughs> it's a major problem. Uh, I mean, they, they did what they could, in other words. Um, but Wagner wrote this and said, don't check on anything, don't cut a note, you know, don't leave a thing out, better not to do it than, at all than do it ill. And then he writes him, like three weeks later, and says, on second thought, I think you should cut out this passage. Anybody know what passage it was? And it's always been cut. It's, it's, it's been cut for good. It's never been done, as far as I know. Second stanza of Infernal Lot. Second stanza of Infernal Lot. And what was, the second, what was in the second stanza of Infernal Lot? Me. Okay, the only this is published, but it's not published with any music to it. I don't know what the music was like. It might have been very much like the first answer. Um, the, the, what it contained was the only place in the score where Lohenman gives a little bit of explanation as to as to why he's come, why he set this 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 uh, uh, um, condition onto Elsa, and um, um, what would have happened had she not asked the question, which we don't I don't, we don't know as it stands. So in other words, the one thing which gives Lohengrin a little bit of motivation, or at least obvious motivation, I mean a plot motivation, and, and also with, um, you know, make the thing seem somehow more real, like it would have said, well, if you had not asked the question, then after one year, you could have come and been my queen and, and lived with me at, at, at Mont Salvat. Well, see, that, that turns it all into something very concrete. That's what was in that text. But he got, he, he, he eliminated it. It's for, when Wagner cuts his own text, which has already got music in the score, the first score that is sent to list. That's that's an extraordinary event. Wagner does not cut his own works very much. Um, you know, for better for worse. In any case, Lohengrin was enormously popular, enormously successful. Um, and I think that actually, um, um, because this this wonderfully uh, charged romantic world of you know, the, the damsel in distress and the knight in white armor and the, the evil witch um, is extremely powerful. Look at the success of Tolkien in today's world. Look, we, we, this, it responds to a very deep human need. And when done at this level, at this really quite transcendental level, it responds, I think, to a very important need. To a very important need for Wagner himself. Lohengrin was a work that he needed to write. And Lohengrin, I think, for Wagner was a very liberatory work. Um, I don't think the Wagner could have gone on. There's a lot of other factors. The revolution, there's a lot of stuff that comes in the way. And Lohengrin, as, as Simon is going to tell us, is very much the work that he wrote also at, during, you know, we think of the ring as being the revolutionary work, but the ring was all written after the revolution had failed. The ring was a work that was actually planned and put together when the revolution had already essentially failed. Lohengrin was the work that he was actually working on as he got really involved with Bakunin and these guys, which is in itself rather interesting. Because, because at first blush, at least, although I'm sure that, that Simon's going to show us that's not true, at first blush, at least, Lohengrin is, is the work of Wagner's by far which deals the least with um, uh, uh, most aspects of, 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 of human, um, you know, of, of, of human relationships. You know, the ring is so much in the, the, the power of money, the struggle between money and, and, uh, uh, and power and greed and desire to control, the relationship between law and freedom, between law and love, the relationship with family relationships, all this kind of, the very, very intense kind of things. Um, but none of which Lohengrin touches on. Lohengrin does, however, touch on one aspect. And I think this is the problem why Lohengrin is not as popular in, in the world after World War II was after World War I. Because Lohengrin is the only work of Wagner's, the only work of Wagner's, which has an element that you could call militaristic. Mm -hmm. After all, right from the start, what's the very first thing that's happening is the king is coming and he's calling up <coughs> far away, you know. He's, calling, he's from Saxony and these guys are in Brabant. That's like, what, 1,500 miles away, something like that? And in that world, they're, I mean, they're not even Germans, really. <coughs> I mean, there's no way in the world they could have understood 
each other in, in historical, I don't know what language they'd be speaking when this is taking place, to go fight the evil Hungarians in the East, you know. Uh, uh, but see, it's, and, and, and even, if, even Lohengrin, who never, never uses his weapon, well, he does use his weapon once to kill Tellers, but not really only in the rest. He doesn't, he's not much more of a fighter really than Parsifal was. I mean, when he does fight, he, you know, he uses magical means rather than, 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 than physical ones. He's obviously not a man of war or violence, and yet Lord right at the end says, you know, go fight them and you'll have victory and this and that and the other. And, and so uh, Lohengrin does have a strong militaristic aspect, or at least a strong sense of calling people to fight. And, um, and, and the only, only work of Wagner's which has any real feeling that there's any good to be had by fighting. I, I would say that almost every other work, I would say every other work of Wagner's, including Meister's here, which is accused of being uh, sort of triumphalistic in a way. But Meister is explicitly against the use of force. I mean, he says that the power of, of Germany is through its art, not through its, its weapons and, and, and its fear. So, uh, uh, um, it's, it's not, I'm not saying that Lohengrin is a militaristic work or praises the mil militaristic might. I don't think it does. But I think that it, it seems to, or it has elements of that which I think bother people today. Bother me a little bit. Um, Lohengrin was the only work of Wagner's, which was in good repute with the Nazi theoreticians. The, uh, now that, again, is by, the Nazi theoreticians adore Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, by the way. You know, one of the things, when people all want to criticize Wagner because, the, 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 because Hitler liked him, it should also be pointed out that the music that the Nazis used the most, the single piece played most by the Nazis infested in Asians, was Beethoven's Ninth, which was also the piece played most often by the Allies infested in Asians. <laughs> So much for music. <laughs> music is very, very ambivalent in these senses. Um, I, I remember, um, a personal aside, I was in um, Germany for the very first time as a kid. And, you know, as a Jewish boy, I, mean, I was, I, I had a very unfortunate experience. The first thing, the first person, I, the first contact I had with any human being in Germany, I was standing in the corner on the train, and the guard, very, the, the, the uh, conductor, very abruptly told me to tuck my shirt in. <laughs> the second thing that happened was I got off the train and in my very good school book German, using lots of subjunctives, asked this gentleman where I should catch the, the, the uh, uh, streetcar to go to this village where I was going to visit my friend, the, the pianist, uh, Christian Zacharias. And he clipped his heels together as he answered. Uh, and then the third thing that happened <laughs> The real, the real, the real killer was the second night I was there in this village. They had a fire in a barn, and uh, well, everybody ran out. They rang the bells and ran out the alarm. And the men uh, to fight the fire had put on their war helmets. So here I'm going outside. These guys. <laughs> this is a long time ago. This is, this is 1971. I was 18 years old. There were still plenty of people. You know, there were about 55, 60 year old men. They had been soldiers, of course. So this all, you know, made me extremely. So I was very hyper. So I was in the, in my friend's house, and we were playing forehand music. But at the same time, I was told my father. What one of the things I did while I was there, and, and Mel still has the picture pictures. I took my scores of the ring and walked out into the Rhine up to my knees and had my pictures taken in the Rhine with my scores. <laughs> I'm wearing these extraordinarily, remember Bell's remember the picture? I had these striped pants that I'm happy to be 18 years old to wear and very long hair. Uh, anyway, I'm a very, very romantic young kid. Uh, so anyway, uh, excuse me? But your shirt was not good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Um, I like the look. Maybe it was in a church that you didn't tuck in. Um, in any of them, we're playing four hour music. We're playing this late prelude. We start this late prelude. And his mother comes out of the kitchen like a banshee, screaming at us, stop, stop, don't play that dreadful music. It's Nazi. Now, Liszt was, Liszt was probably the only non-antisemitic person of the 19th century who wasn't Jewish. And even then, <laughs> or, um, Liszt was anything but a Nazi. This was uh, just sort of the, the antithesis of all that. But the Nazis used Le Prelude to announce on the radio a victories in battle. Oh. And, and this, she and her husband was incarcerated in India for the entire length of the war, but she was sent home. So she was separated from her husband. This is how she spent the whole war with her family in Germany. And, you know, they'd be home and the radio would come on and would play Lake Ray Lute and announce some victory in battle. 
And so we started playing this piece, and she was beside herself. So the power of, this is completely aside, but the, the power of music uh, to conjure up uh, 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 you know, certain historical political states is very strong, but very ambiguous. Very much, the uh, music can be very easily molded to the use of the, the makers. So the fact that Lohengrin was the only piece that, that people like Rosenthal, the people, uh, Rosenberg, um, you know, Alfred Rosenberg, who was the Nazi a theorist, you know, he, I mean, he just, he detested Parsifal and Ring because they're, 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 they're gloomy. They're, 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 the hero loses. You know, he wanted quite seriously the ring to be done, it would be written where Siegfried catches Hagen. This is amazing, this would be amazing. But Hagen is getting ready to stab in the back. Siegfried turns around and wipes him out with no tool. You know, I mean, he wanted to simply have a happy ending to the thing, you know. A real person, that's quite a term, I think you would say. Um, uh, but but Lohengrin, but, but Lohengrin at least offers the sense of, of that there is something to be gained by militaristic action. Um, there's another point of Lohengrin, um, which is not directly about the music, which I really uh, think it's important to say, and which might be a direct outgrowth of this extremely romantic nature, of this, this, this pure romantic nature. Lohengrin strikes me is if we separate it from the romantic nature and look at it in a more sort of analytic, chromatic nature, um, is the gloomiest of all of Wagner's works. Uh, the most despairing. I, mean, I once said that I thought Meister's ear was the most despairing. But I think that, that, that um, the Lohengrin is even more despairing. Meister's ear, in a way, is, has, a, has, it has a certain... Hans Ox's situation is pretty unhappy. But there's a lot more to it. It's, it's, it's not... That, that's really sort of uh, begging the question. But in Lohengrin, Lohengrin has been a failure. Complete failure. He's, he's been a failure. He, well, especially so if he actually loved her before. Uh, and, you know, Elsa, I don't know if she's dead or not, but she might as well be. I mean, the score is very vague about whether she's really dead. I mean, you think she's it has to be dead? It says Entzeit. Entzeit. But yeah, yeah, that's a very romantic language. Soul is taken out of it. Soul is taken out of it. Yeah. That's right. That's, yeah. that's, and what about, what about uh, 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 Orchard? Is she dead too? No, I don't think that's. Well, enough. she says she's in Zales as well, I think. No, I think she faints. I don't think she died. Yeah, yeah no, she's tortured. No, no, she says, no, no, she says Zings, by God, Zings, I'm going to try and slide Susanna. Zings, Susanna. That means she just faints. So we don't know that she's dead or not. She may or may not be dead. Of course, they tell her was dead. Um, so, I mean, I mean it's, it's sort of. There's no glimmer of, I mean, there's no, there's no redemption, there's no, it's true that we, the piece ends on a major chord, you know, with the reminiscence of the grail. So I guess that the idea of the grail remains a sort of romantic symbol, but in terms of the interactions this romantic symbol has had with the characters, it's been entirely a failure, except for one aspect, which is one that I find, I think that none of us, how many of us really care very much about Gottfried von Paul? <laughs> Does anyone really? You do, of course. But that's kind of, because I, I think maybe Wagner did. But, but it's very hard for us to. For a character that we haven't seen, and it, hasn't, it was talked about a little bit at the beginning, but, but, but it, it, it's difficult, I think. To, uh, he has no music of his own, or no. Uh, there's no identifying feature. He's just, you know. Yes, I guess he is the hopeful thing at the end. He's back to be their leader. Uh, which, uh, in a very unfortunate use of words, Lohengrin's, Lohengrin's last words in the opera are "Zay da de Herzog von Abant zu Führer sei der," which is too bad. He yes. will be your Führer. That's what he says. That's the last thing he says. That's it. Uh, no, he says, well, "We'll hear it tomorrow." I, I wonder how they translate it. I don't have. I have a whole German. But you, thank you for your last line. But it, it, nevertheless, now, now I do think probably that Wagner felt that, that the character of Gottfried was quite important. But nevertheless, I think that it's very difficult. Uh, Lohengrin, this is another aspect of Lohengrin, which I'm stepping on your toes, but this is a completely personal um, a point. Um, Lohengrin is the only Wagnerian work in which I have almost always seen excellent and completely convincing stages. And I think this grows also directly out of the fact that it is this quintessential romantic work. Um, um, for instance, I am absolutely not, not fond of Robert Wilson as a stage designer, but I thought his was written as you did, Jim. And I thought it was completely convincing. Um, uh, Wagner's, uh, the first and the second. 
Vlog Wagner's uh, uh, Lohengrin is fantastic. I've seen lots of good Lohengrins. The only bad Lohengrin I saw was just now at La Scala. I saw Lohengrin this year at La Scala, and that was bad. Not entirely bad. The, the worst you'd see. I just, did you, you have anything about it or not? Yeah, no, I, I, I haven't seen that one. I, I've seen a couple of, 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 of bad ones. They're just sort of, Gertz Friedrich did one in Munich that was uh -huh. messy. But this, this one, this one, the problem, yeah. this one had one very unfortunate thing. This guy actually did what I consider to be the ultimate sin. Um, he cut almost the entire bridal course, which in itself is not necessarily the ultimate sin. I'm not. Way not the, the, but the reason he cut it was because um, the bridal course was completely off stage. We saw uh, Lohengrin and, and um, um, uh, Elsa in the bridal chamber. The bridal chamber contained a large grand piano, which were cocktail. Oh, that's the Lehmhoff production. What? That's the Lehmhoff production. Yeah, that's right, Lehmhoff production. You yeah. see it? It's just out on DVD, the yeah, I've got bar. It. I have it here. So he's playing the piano. It's, it's, it's actually playing for It's pretty it's striking. It, it is. And, it's and, and in the original, you know, around and around circles, like a Liberace sort of thing. And, and he, he recognized that it was something he couldn't sustain for as long as the chorus. So he figured he better cut the chorus. He cut three quarters of the chorus because otherwise it would have been too unbearable to have the guy playing the piano. I'm, I'm sure I, I've actually got a, I got a picture of that on. Uh, okay, so, okay, that's that. Okay, now the, the last point I want to make, which is going to lead to what I'm going to do on Sunday, is strictly about music. Um, Lohengrin is, as a, um, as a dramatic image, I think, has the symbols very clear, very unambiguous of good versus evil. Um, the most unambiguous of any work of honor. I think definitely the most unambiguous. Partly because there was, we don't have the motivations of the people behind them, they could, they could you know, or it could be evil. We don't have, I mean, Albert certainly has a very evil uh, a design for, for mankind, for, for the world. But we know where he's coming from. And so we have all sorts of complex feelings about him. I mean, poor guy, you know, he had to deal with these awful, you know, the teasing of the rye maidens and, you know, the, the, the evil incident that tough. You know, you can think of all kinds of reasons to feel sorry for him. And there's almost kind of nobility about his, his, I mean, he's, he's the one non hypocrite in the whole ring. Uh, uh, but Orchard, these issues don't even exist. We don't come into these issues. I mean, I mean unless somebody's some, uh, an apologist for, for Vodan and Freya and you know, whatever the, the ancient goddesses. I mean, she's just a switch. You know, she's, she's just an evil character. And, 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 and Lohengrin is a rather sad but evil, uh, but, but, but good guy, a, white, a knight in white armor. And, and certainly so is Elsa. Just, I mean, and by the way, one of the points, we may, while watching, someone may, I never did, Someone may, while watching uh, Lohengrin, you know how if, when you see a good performance of Othello, um, you're always saying, don't believe them. Don't listen to them. Don't, don't, don't pay it. You know, you're, you're just dying for this time. But is anyone really saying uh, all of it to Elsa? Don't ask them the question. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. I mean, I, it's, I, this is so obvious that she's going to have to ask the question. I mean, it just seems just so completely. Maybe that is the tragedy. There are any number of women like that. You may not know that. <laughs> <laughs> me to them. <laughs> no, that's the real no questions asked. <laughs> that's really, you know, I'll marry you, no questions asked. That's, 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 that's really it. Um, anyway, the, 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 our Wagner has already started to some extent in Flying Dutchman, but to a much greater extent in um, Tom Weiser, experimenting with the musical score where the, the music uh, exists not only um, as numbers or as individual pieces that describe the emotional or dramatic setting, which would be the way that opera, romantic opera and classical opera had existed, but which also sort of epitomize certain dramatic types. Um, uh, for instance, the, the, there's certainly we have in, in, in Tannhäuser the, the Venusberg music, all the music that we associate with Venusberg. It's, it's not just a theme, but it's a whole kind of music, a whole sound. You know, for instance, when in the third act of, of, of Tannhäuser, when he, uh, he, he conjures up, when he finally is calling for and then he comes out, we hear that music, it's immediately an enormous break. It's a completely different kind of music from the music of St. Elizabeth and, and you know, the, 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 the pilgrimage to Rome and, and other sorts. Now, there's other kinds of music as well, but there's definitely this sort of opposition. Um, and Lohengrin takes this much further, the furthest he does in any of his works, between the music of the good guys, the forces of good, and the music of the bad guys. 
And there are completely different kinds of music. I'm going to go into the, the, what kinds of music they are uh, um, on Sunday. But one of the things they have, and one of the aspects of, of Lohengrin, which is most extraordinary, is that even though Lohengrin has very little what we call development, I, I should be specific in my uh, terminology here, musical development means, um, well, it means two things, but, but it means on a specific sense, on an on a, on a, on a individual sense, it means the composer's taking material, tunes or ideas or rhythms or whatever, and um, making them undergo alterations, which keep enough of their basic essence that we recognize where they're coming from, but would cause them to sound different or to, to appear in different phrases. And, and, and there, there, there are really two major reasons why composers have always done that. One reason is that it allows a piece of music to be longer. You know, one of the big problems that the composer has is if you're going to write a piece of music which is two minutes long, you can just do a tune. It can be just a simple expository tune and you're done and you go home. But if you want to write a piece of music which is 20 minutes long or 40 minutes long or two hours long, um, you have to find some other solution. It's very difficult to write a 40-minute tune which is all in one direction. In other words, it doesn't ever repeat itself, it just keeps on going. Um, and what happens is the listener almost very early on loses the thread. This doesn't have anywhere to, it doesn't have anything to hold on to. So, but by the same token, you can play the same uh, tune, two-minute tune, and you repeat it 20 times. That's one way to do it. Just repeat it over and over again. Um, that's not very satisfying. After all, we get tired of that too. Although it can be done, it has been done. Philip Glass. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not quite true, actually. Um, you can take that tune and dress it up in different ways, and and have what we call variations, which would be basically sort of like having a vaudeville act, where you've got a guy come out on stage and then he comes out 15, 20, 30, 40 times in different costumes. And they can be very elaborate costumes, I and mean, they can be more. But you still, you know, it's the same guy in the costume. And that's also, that's, that's a kind of a way of development, you can say, although variation is, is but it's still very static. And it's, the relationship is always one to two, one to three, one to four. They represent sort of uh, uh, pieces of something, you know, and, and, uh, like a, a ball, which is, has a one to one correspondence. But the ball itself is the ball. It stays what it is as, 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 a, as an entity, as it were. But composers wanted something which was more um, uh, active and more in constant movement and change. And one that, 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 that also gave them a chance to create the sense of the power of time within music. One of the really important aspects of music is that we, we experience music as its relationship goes in time. For instance, if I play this important thing with, with enormous amounts of psychological depth, Real nitty-gritty, the real essence of what Wagner's trying to do with his music 
is trying to, to make the listener feel the power of time as it passes. In other words, to say, I've heard that before, and now it means something different. Or I've heard that before, and now it means the same thing. Or just simply, I've heard that before. You know, just the power, or even, or even more powerfully, when you don't even say to yourself, um, I've heard that before, when you just simply feel, boy, those were the good old days, things have changed now. Or, yeah, it, was, it was tough back then, but things look worse. You know, the sense of dramatic movement. I, I think people, uh, playwrights do it with plays too, but words used to have a different repertoire to use them. Is anyway, the main, going back to this, the main technique that Wagner uses through his works to, to give this is basically use this concept of development, of taking certain amount of digital ideas and changing them. And so when we hear the changes, we don't necessarily recognize even that it's the, the, the original that's been changed, and then we recognize it and we say, aha, and there's that feeling. We link this point Q to point F and point A, and there's this kind of of, of, of unity and movement and change all at once in the sense of the dramatic progression. Lohengrin, however, uses very little of this because Lohengrin is not about trying to create the sense of the feeling of change very much. The one motif in Lohengrin, the one that we think of as a light motif in the usual sense, would be, you know, the 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 these old stupid you know, the, you never ask, don't ask me the question. That. And every time we hear it, we're reminded of the fact that he told her not to ask the question. And it's very, very straightforward. But it doesn't undergo any development. It doesn't change. Um, the, the theme that we hear at the beginning of the piece, um, the, the grail, that's what we want to call it. It's a, as good a name as any. And it makes sense because it comes back exactly as it was in the beginning in Inferno Lot, when, when, when Longer starts talking about the fact that he comes from the land of the Grail. Um, now that music doesn't develop either, but what it does do is it transforms itself into lots of different variants. It doesn't go through um, this constant metamorphosis, but it has to. So it's much more like a variation. It's like, it's like the guy, the vaudeville actor, the vaudeville actor doesn't actually change his molecular structure. That, maybe that's a, a, good, a good way to describe the difference in variation and development. And if it were, if it were to, uh, development, the vaudeville actor actually becomes something different. He actually literally changes the structure, and he's doing it all the time in front of her eyes. Whereas in variation, the vaudeville actor says, second folks, comes back out, now he's dressed up as a woman. Or he comes back out, now he's, now he's got handlebar mustaches and a big, a big uh, barrel hat. And that's the way it is in Lohengrin. To an unbelievable degree, to an incredible degree, to, from a musical standpoint, to quite, a, quite an amazing degree, um, Wagner has united all the good guy music, all the good guy music, all the happy, positive music in Lohengrin, it all is basically the same music. It's all this Wagner actor in hundreds of different guises. The bad guy music is not that way. It's the, 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 and for that, the bad guy music is more developable. And it's not by accident. One thing that Jim said was is that the scene that people always point to be the scene that is most like the music in the ring is the first scene of Act Two. I, to me, it sounds the most like it. it Happens to be my favorite part of Lohengrin, actually. Um, except for the two that you started us out with. That, that's one of those great, you're right, Bellini would have been happy to write that note. Well, that's still the end of that scene. Um, but the scene between, between Orchard and, 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 and uh, Tellerman, when they're outside and it's dark, it's gloomy, and it's an F-sharp minor, um, the bad guy, that's really the quintessential bad guy music, and we know it's the bad guy music too. Um, that music is a lot like the music in the ring, not just because it's bad guy music and there's bad guy music in the ring, or because it's gloomy and there's gloomy music in the ring, but because it's developmental, it's in constant change, which is like the music in the ring and not like the rest of the music in lower ring. There's one other place in Lohengrin which I'm going to go into, which has yet another feature which is really common in most of Wagner's works, but which is not common in Lohengrin at all, and which to me is always um, has the most fascination in, in other Wagner works, but which really doesn't have a place in a piece like Lohengrin where um, things are so archetypal and, 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 and put essentially romantic. Um, and that's ambiguity. There's extraordinarily little ambiguity musically or dramatically in, in Lohengrin. Uh, uh, you know, 
Uh, the ring practically makes the science out of ambiguity. More than any other rock works, the ring, so much of the time in the ring, we really don't know what something is. Either musically or dramatically, things are not clear. They're, 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 because they can be seen in more ways than one. You know, to me, the, the, like for instance, when you hear in the, in the Norn scene, you can't tell anymore whether it's the Hala music or the ring music. It could be either one. It's sort of perfect, you know, and, and whereas, the, um, and even Parsifal has a certain amount of ambiguous. Parsifal is, is model on Lone Ring to some extent, and then it also has not bad guy and good guy music, but. Um,